Martin Schungauer is a German engraver and painter. He comes from the city of Colmar in Alsace. Now, some of you know that Alsace uh, today is part of France. It's right on that border between Germany and France. But in the 15th century, it was German territory. And so some of the names of the cities, for example, do sound very uh, Germanic rather than French. Colmar, Isenheim, for example. It is an area that over the centuries has been disputed and after one war it will become German, and after another it will become French. But today it's France, but in the 15th century it was German. And you can still go to Colmar. It is a beautiful place. Uh, they have uh, old buildings, uh, including Martin Schungauer's house. It's still there. Now, he comes from a family of uh, artisans. Uh, he himself is a painter and an engraver. His father was a goldsmith. And three of his brothers also became goldsmiths in Colmar. Uh, but Martin and his brother Ludwig uh, became painters. Presumably, he would have gotten his first training, though, in his father's goldsmith workshop. Uh, a goldsmith would have had to uh, do drawings of, for example, very elaborate, uh, what, reliquaries, monstrance, beautiful vessels. Uh, and they also uh, would be skilled in incising in uh, the metal. And that's one of the things that um, we think that uh, engraving probably came out of metalworking. Although we think that Martin's first training in drawing and engraving probably came from his goldsmith father, um, if he's a painter, he couldn't have served an apprenticeship with him. So where did he uh, receive his, his official training, his apprenticeship? Well, um, across the street and a few doors down, uh, in fact, in the you know, exact same neighborhood, is where Caspar, or Gaspard, uh, Eisenmann lived. And Eisenmann was the leading painter in Colmar at that time. So he's uh, a bit older than uh, Schongauer. And so many people assume that he would have been Martin Schongauer's uh, painting teacher, his, uh, uh, his uh, first master. Uh. And so I thought, you might want to see what some of his work looks like. Uh, and so here we have a uh, resurrection uh, scene by uh, Eisenmann. However, Schungauer seems to have been much influenced by the Flemish artists. In fact, Max J. Friedlander, who is the great connoisseur of uh, Netherlandish painting. He's the one who uh, ass first assigned the artists uh, to different groups and attributed uh, different artists, uh, different works to different artists, deciding you know who painted this and who painted that. Um, so Friedlander said that Schungauer was the spirit of Roger van der Weyden reborn on German soil. So I suppose you could kind of think of Martin Schungauer as uh, the German Roger van der Weyden. Only Roger, as far as we know, never did engravings. And Schungauer, um, he did many paintings as well, but most of the survival of his work uh, are his engravings. Um, but certainly there's uh, a strong influence there. So, so let's compare uh, this engraving by Martin Schungauer, a half-length image of the Virgin and Child, uh, with some paintings by the Virgin, with some paintings of the Virgin and Child by Roger van der Weyden or his workshop. And you can see that there is certainly a similarity in facial features uh, and the, the general type.
Now, we perceive strong influence on Schongauer uh, of Roger van der Weyden's work. But Roger died in July of 1464. And it's been suggested that Martin was probably too young to have served an, an entire apprenticeship with Roger van der Weyden. We don't know the exact date that Martin was born. Um, the usual speculative date that's given is around 1450. So if he was 14, that's about the time a young man would probably start his apprenticeship, about age 14 to 18 years old. So it's conceivable that Martin went to Flanders, went to Brussels uh, to begin an apprenticeship with Roger van der Weyden, but that Roger died. Martin's probably too young to have completed an apprenticeship with Roger van der Weyden. And there's been a couple of other suggestions about how he might have known Roger's work. One is that after getting his training in Germany, in Colmar, he went to Flanders for a Wanderjahr, which means a wander year, a year in which uh, having achieved his journey, uh, having completed, a year in which having completed his apprenticeship, he goes as a journeyman and travels around uh, for a year, the Wanderjahr, uh, to see art from different places, uh, to gain more experience, and you know, probably supports himself on his trip by you know, hiring on as a hired man, a journeyman, uh, in uh, workshops wherever he can. So one idea is that he went to Flanders and he saw a lot of work by Roger van der Weyden. So the idea is that Schongauer may have gone to Flanders for his Wanderjahr and saw works by Roger van der Weyden and uh, made drawings of them and been influenced that way. Another suggestion that has been made is that Schongauer might have worked in Memling's workshop. Now, you'll remember that most art historians think that there's some kind of workshop relationship with Hans Memlink and Roger van der Weyden, that either Memlink apprenticed with Roger van der Weyden, or that he served as a journeyman in Roger van der Weyden's workshop, or that he, he trained there, he got his apprenticeship, and then he stayed on and worked. We, we, know, we don't know exactly. Um, the documents about um, the documents about the Painters Guild uh, in Brussels were destroyed in the 17th century during war. But that might be possible. After all, Memlink set up his own workshop in Bruges, what, January of 1465 by our way of dating it. So about six months after Roger's death. Now, if Schongauer came hoping to be an apprentice with Roger van der Weyden and Roger died, maybe he transferred to Memling's workshop. Yeah, maybe he went to Bruges with him and they worked together. We don't know. There are no documents that say this. Uh, there's no document that gives uh, Martin uh, or anybody with a name like Schongauer uh, as an apprentice to Hans Memling. Uh, is it that we don't have the documents, or could he have been a journeyman? And there wouldn't be any record of that. But anyway, those are some possibilities. Uh, the truth of the matter is we just don't know. Certainly, Schongar was familiar with other Flemish artists. Uh, and here you see a painting that you've seen before by Dirk Bouts, uh, the Virgin and Child, uh, seated in front of a cloth of honor, uh, and a window sort of in the corner of a, a room with the Christ child uh, on a pillow uh, and uh, in a kind of window frame. And that motif is repeated again in this half-length Virgin and Child by uh, Schongauer. So we're seeing kind of the, the different motifs.
the child on the pillow and the corner of the room and a landscape through the window and a cloth behind. Um, and yet the Virgin herself looks much more like uh, Roger Vanderbyne's Virgin than it does Dirk Bouts's. So it's a, a, a kind of combination of influences here. Okay, we said that Martin Schongauer was a painter. So we're going to look at uh, a few paintings, and then we're going to look at more of his engravings. Uh, this is still in the Church of St. Martin's in Colmar. It is dated 1473, and as you can see, it is the Virgin and Child in a Rose Bower. And it has some of that Marian imagery that comes from the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon. Uh, Mary is uh, in the Hortus Conclusus, uh, uh, the bride of Song of Solomon says that she is a garden enclosed. She also calls herself a Rose of Sharon, a Lily of the Valley, and as you can see this is a rose garden. Uh, the painting actually was a bit larger originally. We have a 16th century copy. Uh, showing the original configuration where you have God the Father at the top and he seems to have been cut off and uh, possibly a bit more spacious uh, foliage on either side that the uh, work of art has been cut off at the top and the sides. So originally you would have seen a trinity with uh, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit up above that crown that the angels are holding. And so uh, we have Mary, Queen of Heaven, uh, with the angels uh, and uh, the beautiful little Christ child uh, you know, clinging to her. So let's take a look at some of the details of this. Uh, the beautiful crown. A strawberry plant. Uh, there's a little beautiful foliage in this. Uh, the angel. And here you see some of the birds and more flowers in this uh, Marian garden or arbor. That's a fairly large painting. This is a tiny little painting. Uh, it's a just a little bit smaller than what we would say is a, a sh normal sheet of paper. Uh, and it's a small, intimate picture. I'm sure it was for personal devotion. And we also see that emphasis on the family. This is, of course, the holy family. We don't have any shepherds or magi. We just uh, see Mary, the Christ child, Joseph, uh, still evidently in the stable because there's the ox and the ass and uh, Joseph is bringing in the fodder for the animals which also might be wheat and then would serve as a kind of Eucharistic symbol. You have a tender relationship between the mother and child and once again, the grapes, a Eucharistic motif referring to the wine of the sacrament, the blood of Christ shed for the salvation of mankind, Christ as the true vine, uh, or in this case, uh, some food for the baby, who seems to be taking solid food very early, doesn't he? And we also have this positive view of Joseph as the humble, hard-working protector of his wife and child. Um, we often point out how that some of these images do have that what we might call middle-class values, emphasis on family and on uh, St. Joseph as the person who is the protector of Mary and the Christ child. Now, Joseph is usually shown as an old man, as he is here. Um, and that, of course, is um, a suggestion that oh, he's too old to be the father, the biological father of Christ. And you'll remember when we talked about the Moroda altarpiece, we were talking about this idea of the, uh, the trap that fooled the devil, uh, that you know, Christ's flesh was the trap that fools the devil, but also the fact that 
you know, he seems to have a father here, a biological man. Um, but so that, you know, is he really the son of God? Uh, he, he, he has a father. You know, he helps to fool the devil. Uh, and, of course, if Joseph is really too old to uh, have fathered the child, then that would attest to the virgin birth. It's uh, a suggestion, uh, not a surety, I guess we could say. Okay, we talked about Schongauer as an engraver. And so, first I want to talk to you about what an engraving is. Um, an engraving is a kind of print and a print is when you are transferring ink from one surface to another. Uh, in this case, from a metal plate to a paper. And you can make multiple images of that. Okay, how do you make an engraving? You remember that when we talked about woodcut, we said that the uh, cutter would remove all of the wood that was not going to be printed. This is exactly the opposite. In this case, you have lines cut into a metal plate. At this time, it would usually be copper. And they would use a tool called a burin, B-U-R-I-N. And when you cut the grooves into this plate, you are removing the metal. It comes up um, in little sometimes in little curly cues even. Um, but it is, it is removed from the metal, so it's a very precise line. And it takes a lot of skill. After you have carved all of these grooves or incised lines into the plate, you would ink the plate. And you make sure that you get the ink down into the grooves, as you see on this diagram. And then you wipe the surface of the plate. Uh, you'll be leaving sort of a translucent film of, or a transparent film of ink that gives it a kind of tone, but most of the ink is in the grooves. You have to leave that in the, in the incised areas. Now, I'm going to tell you something that's wrong with this uh, diagram here. Uh, they're showing the plate as though it is a kind of squared off form. That wouldn't fit for the printing press. Uh, you would have the edges would be beveled or sloped, and that would help the roller press, and we'll see a picture in just a minute, uh, you know, roll over the plate. So you've got it inked, you've got it wiped. Uh, you take your paper, usually uh, dampened ragged paper, and you put that on top And then you put it through a roller press. Um, actually, you would have what they call blankets, which are pieces of felt uh, that would go on top or, and would uh, cushion the, uh, the print uh, so it's not going to tear. Uh, and it would also help you so that you can uh, get, the, it, would, it would help uh, because the rollers are going to push the paper down into the grooves, and that will pick up the ink. And then your print, your engraving, uh, will be paper with the ink image on it, and it will be slightly embossed. So here you see a diagram of one of these roller presses. Uh, either the rollers can move, or more usually, um, what we call the bed, the horizontal surface, uh, will move between the rollers. Now. Here's a little detail, not from Schongauer, from uh, another very famous engraver, Albrecht Dürer. Uh, and it's just a detail from two of his prints, one from an engraving and one from a woodcut. But what we're trying to show is that you can get finer lines, you can get more gradations of shading with an engraving than with a woodcut. Even the most detailed woodcut, and this certainly is from one of those, uh, can't get the fine quality of those lines. And you can understand why, because if you get your lines, they're raised bits of wood, if you make them too fine, they're splinters, they'll just break off. Uh, 
So there is a difference in the type of image that you'll see with an engraving and with a woodcut. So now let's look at some engravings by Martin Schungauer. We've already seen this one. It's called the Madonna and Child with a Parrot. And uh, you know, you'll remember the symbolism of the parrot. I think I talked about that before with Jan van Eyck. Uh, the parrot is a, a, an exotic bird. It comes from tropical countries and has to be imported. It has beautiful foliage. Uh, so it can be seen as a kind of paradisial bird from, uh, you know, a, a kind of Eden-like place. But also, it was believed that the parrot's uh, call was Ave! Ave! So it was Ave, hail, the angelic salutation. So it becomes associated with the virgin birth um, and uh, with the Annunciation and, and, as you can see, with the virgin and child. Now, Schongauer is creating prints as what we would call fine art as well as commercial production. It's commercial production. He's making them uh, to earn a living, but then so do fine artists. Uh, they're all making it to earn a living. Um, but some of the woodcuts, I mean, we've shown you some beautiful woodcuts, but some of the woodcuts were uh, kind of crude and rude, uh, and these have all the qualities that you can do with the, you know, one black and white or, you know, whatever the, the color of the ink is. Um, images, you have shading, you have beautiful details, um, you know, you have very high quality images. Now this one is a little early uh, and it, it's, been, it's been pointed out uh, that the spatial quality is, is not exactly perfect, uh, that uh, uh, Schoengauer is able to show the setting uh, much more believably in uh, works that are a little bit earlier. So this is given a fairly early date of about 1470 to 75. Um, I should say that we don't know the dates of these, uh, so sometimes you will find books that have alternate uh, dating. So we date his engravings um, in the 1470s and the 1480s. You'll remember he died in 1491. So here are some of the details. And you can see all of the different types of lines that he makes. Uh, and how, if you look at, say, the, uh, the torso of the Christ child, the line seems to curve around the torso. So this is just a little bit of what we call contour modeling. Uh, in other words, that the line follows the volume or the solidity of, you know, what is supposed to be uh, the form. Oh, obviously, it's really flat. And you can see places where he has not done that, uh, you know, where he's just uh, used straight hatching lines, uh, but other places where he has uh, started to try to show you the volume a little bit more. And you know, as I say, this, this is an early work. We're going to see his skill level increase. Uh, but I just want to point out some of the different ways that line is used. We have cross hatching, and that is when uh, the straight lines are crossing one another and is forming a, a kind of textured, uh, darker background. And of course, we have hatching, where you have straight lines that uh, make the shades. And then he has these uh, at the, the very edge. Uh, just uh, dashes that have been uh, carved into the plate uh, that are not continuous lines. And he's trying to give you the texture of the stone a little bit there. Okay, let's see some other work by him. Uh, this is uh, a nativity or an adoration of the Christ child, or you could even call it a holy family. And you can see, even though they're giving it approximately the same date, uh, that Martin Schungauer's uh, rendition of space and setting is uh, improved from that earlier uh, image that we just saw. You have uh, a kind of archway that is the edge of the ruined stone building that is uh, the, the stable in this case. Uh, it's got a hole in the roof and uh, uh, you know, much of the 
the stonework is, is falling apart, uh, and yet we look through this uh, opening of a, sort of a slightly pointed arch, and we see the Holy Family adoring the Christ child, uh, lying on the ground. That uh, motif that we saw in Roger van der Weyden, uh, that just gets picked up by many, many artists of the Christ child lying on the edge of Mary's mantle. And of course, uh, here we have the ox and the ass uh, paying homage. Uh, Joseph, rather than holding the candle that St. Bridget mentions, is holding a lantern, uh, but presumably the idea is the same, uh, that uh, you know, the light of the Christ child would be outweighing any natural light. Um, to make your lines darker and lighter with engraving, uh, you would make the incised grooves darker and lighter. So, um, you know, a very a shallow groove will pick up less ink. And so you have uh, a kind of atmospheric quality of the very faint ink as you go looking off into the background and see the Annunciation to the Shepherds. And then sort of uh, in between, in the middle, you have the, the shepherds who have arrived and are peering through uh, one of these openings. And here we can see uh, details. You can see that we have that contour line going around the little colonnette, making it seem as though it is indeed cylindrical. Um, those uh, dashes to suggest stone. Some uh, cross hatching to give you some, you know, dark background areas. And look at the drapery. You're seeing on the edge of the drapery. Uh, sort of some curving lines that suggest, yes, this is, this is rounded. Or in the uh, concave shape of uh, Joseph Drapery, for example, um, the lines uh, seem to curve up a little bit. Right? They uh, are actually uh, in a depression, in a, 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 a concave surface. And uh, some more details. There you see uh, both the shepherds looking in and the, the Christ child uh, with the animals. Uh, details of stonework with the plants growing into them and uh, some uh, angels presumably singing Gloria in excelsis Deus uh, at the birth of the Christ child up there in the corner. We also see uh, the flight into Egypt. And here, you know, Mary and the Christ child are on the back of the donkey. And you'll notice that this tree is bending over. Now, there is a story, a legend, about the miracle of the date palm. And so this is a palm tree. And the idea is that the uh, Holy Family are on their journey to Egypt, fleeing uh, Herod's soldiers who wished to kill the child. And on the way, of course, they need more food. And so uh, a miracle is performed. You know, the Christ child gives the order and the date palm bends down. Now here, uh, we're seeing how that happens. All these angels are pulling the palm down so that Joseph can harvest uh, the dates. Um, in England, uh, I don't know how many of you know uh, English folk songs, but there is a Christmas carol, uh, an English uh, medieval folk song called the Cherry Tree Carol. And it's slightly different, but I think it's probably based on the same, same idea. Uh, in that one, Joseph doubts Mary's virginity and the Christ child tells the cherry tree, you know, bend down the highest branch that my mother might have some. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so it's transfer. There aren't any date palms in England, so it becomes a, a cherry tree. Um, this very strange uh, tree that you see here in the corner is known as a dragon palm or a dragon tree. And we'll be seeing it again in some other works of art. For example, Hieronymus Bosch. This is the temptation of St. Anthony. It always sounds a little odd to call it a temptation because what's really going on is the devils are tormenting St. Anthony. Uh, this is St. Anthony Abbott. 
he was one of the earliest hermit saints uh, to go out into the wilderness, uh, try to think only of God, um, deny his body, uh, you know, um, fleeing sexual temptation, fleeing worldly temptation, um, and he was tormented by devils. Uh, they would come to him in the guise of beautiful women, but he did not succumb to temptation. And on one occasion, uh, the devils grab him and carry him up in the sky. And as you can see, they pinch him and prod him and beat him. And then they just, they just throw him down to the earth. And that obviously is, is what's going on here because we see just a little bit of landscape at the bottom as those are rocky hillside. Uh, so this is, this is happening sort of up in the sky, uh, and you can see how all of these, uh, the, all of these devils are, uh, you know, just tormenting the poor man. The, the saint himself is very, very calm. Uh, you know, he's right not, he's not reacting, in a sense. Uh, as, it's like, you know, they do their worst, and uh, he's, he's not going to give way to uh, emotion. And, of course, this is the way that northern artists show devils. They are monstrous creatures. And by monstrous, we mean that they are against nature. They're not like God would have wanted them to be. You know, they're deformed in some way. And they create these horrible devils by putting different animal and sometimes human parts together. You know, these, these, these parts should be, this should be in a fish, and you know, this should be on a bat, and uh, all different uh, 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 animal parts. And as you can see, uh, Schongauer has used uh, the uh, black line uh, to create these naturalistic textures so that you feel like you've got spines or fur or scales uh, or kind of the you know, overlapping body of an insect, uh, all of these different textures uh, that are shown here. Just uh, beautiful Christ on the cross, calm, contemplative. And the, you have this beautiful arabesque of the edge of the loincloth that just sort of floats in the heaven. Uh, you may remember that Roger van der Weyden did a very similar thing in his uh, Vienna uh, crucifixion. You have a beautiful landscape background, uh, and you have the angels gathering the blood of Christ in chalices. And here we're seeing the suffering of Christ as he carries the cross. This is Christ carrying the cross, or the way of the cross, or the way to Calvary. You know, some number of things you could call it. Um, and this is uh, one of the most elaborate of Schongauer's uh, engravings, probably the most elaborate one. Um, you have in the center the cross of Christ. And Christ has been forced to carry this, and he has fallen. And his face is looking you know, straight out at the viewer. And then you have all of his tormentors, uh, you know, people prodding him, beating him, uh, the people who have condemned him to death follow the cross. Um, and as you can see, there's a whole cavalcade of, of people. Uh, before him, the two thieves are tied, but they're not having to go through the great suffering that Christ is at this point. Uh, and we see the rear ends of uh, several horses showing us that they are, you know, they're going off in the distance, they're foreshadowed, and also showing us the skill of the artist who can uh, create such a believable foreshortening. If you look just in front of the cross piece, you'll see that there's a kind of opening in the, in the crowd. And on the far side of that, there is a woman, and that is probably Saint Veronica. And then if you look into that uh, distance here, where you have this kind of winding road, uh, you can see uh, Mary and John and the holy women uh, lamenting. 
So let's look at some of the details. Here we have Christ falling. And he stares out at the viewer. You know, he makes eye contact with the person who would be looking at this print and um, maybe thinking about the life of Christ, trying to uh, perhaps imagine himself in that crowd. The message, of course, is that Christ died for you. you know, he's facing you right there. And then we see the details of uh, the cavalcade. And here is that detail that I was talking about where you're seeing uh, St. Veronica. And then in the distance, uh, you're seeing the holy, uh, the holy women, John and uh, Mary uh, lamenting. I assume that some of these figures are Caiaphas and uh, Pilate. Probably the turbaned figure would be Pilate. And then you have the people who you know, follow and mock Christ. Note the different quality of the lines and uh, how the lines, by this time, you know, he's a, a master of every texture you can create and how the, uh, the, uh, the shading, uh, you know, will follow the contour of the uh, presumably solid, you know, because the illusion of solidity. And of course, then uh, you have this atmospheric quality of the very, very faint lines uh, that create the distant landscape. The arrest of Christ pretty dramatic. Uh, Christ is bound. He's going to be taken away, but uh, St. Peter fights back. <laughs> so uh, and the tormentors, as we often see in northern paintings, are shown with sort of uh, grotesque faces, uh, you know, nasty facial expressions. Uh, and if you look on the far right, excuse me, if you look on the far left, your left, uh, you'll see a profile figure who looks very, very sinister, and he's clutching a money bag. That is Judas Iscariot. You know, he's identified Christ for his for the soldiers, and now he's leaving with his ill-gotten gains. He's, he's shown as the villain of the piece, of course, one of the villains of the piece. Uh, not everything was a religious subject. Uh, Martin Schongauer did some other work, uh, including uh, this uh, secular art, this uh, image of an elephant. Um, and if you try to take it apart and look at it anatomically, you will find some, uh, many, errors. Schongauer probably never saw an elephant, uh, but there was uh, an elephant in Europe and there were some drawings made, and so this is probably taken from a drawing or engraving of the elephant, and then you know, was, he thought it'd be a popular subject, and he uh, uh, embellished it and uh, engraved it himself. These are two prints that go together to create the image of the Annunciation. And that makes perfect sense, because if you think about it, Oftentimes, when you would have a painted triptych, on the back of the wings, the side panels, uh, when you would close the triptych, you would have on one side Gabriel and on the other side Mary. You would have an Annunciation in two panels. So here we have it on two pieces of paper. And as you can see, uh, they date this one a little later. It's, um, you, you'll, we'll look at some of the details and you'll see the great skill with which he has created uh, the solidity of the forms. Uh, and also how very, very graceful this is. The, uh, the, this beautiful, I, I'm gonna use the word arabesque again, I apologize, but this beautiful arabesque of the curving lines of the banderole, uh, this uh, kind of banner that, uh, that Gabriel's carrying, and also how the edge of Mary's drapery, you know, curves up into, uh, you know, just this beautiful shape that breaks up the background shape and makes the uh, negative shape of the ba of the background uh, an interesting shape. 
So here we're looking at the details, and here you can see um, you know, very well-developed contour lines. You have not only the edges of everything, uh, but also that the shading itself seems to follow uh, the depressions, the concavities, uh, the raised areas of the drapery. You know, as though they're curving in or rising up or uh, following around uh, an actual solid form. And that, of course, helps to give you that, that feeling of solidity. And there's a, certainly a, a variety of, uh, of strokes which you know, give you a, a more interest in the surface, as well as a sense of texture. You can see where you have the uh, uh, darker areas. He's used uh, cross-hatching. And here you see the same thing with the detail of the Virgin Mary. The lilies are just you know, beautiful curving lines against the background. And then there is that uh, feeling of shading and solidity of these uh, draperies, which you know, really almost have a life of their own. But you can, uh, you can see why they say the influence of Roger van der Weyden, I think, uh, uh, in the draperies particularly. And so all of the different types of modeling here. Uh, the line going around Mary's face, around her neck. Well, that's the contour mo uh, modeling. And of course you can see some cross hatching. And then you can just see some parallel lines. And you know, there's variations of these, a little short, in the lower right of this detail, you see these short little lines that cross sort of a, horizontally at an angle, uh, some pale vertical lines, which gives a different texture. Uh, you might also notice the curling uh, cascading tresses of her hair. Um, and keep those in mind when we look at sculptors, because you'll find that sculptors sometimes try to imitate, do, do imitate that same kind of curling locks. And of course, they're using uh, you know, chisels and drills rather than uh, uh, line. More details of the folds. And uh, one last quiet image. Uh, this is the Madonna and Child in the courtyard with Mary's uh, voluminous uh, draperies spread around us, breaking into all of these um, active angular folds that uh, certainly do remind us of Roger van der Weyden. Uh, Mary here is in the courtyard, uh, so it becomes a, a hortus conclusus, an enclosed garden. And then there's this dead tree. It's a, why a dead tree? Uh, does it refer to sin? You know, the, the, the tree of knowledge withering away, perhaps? Or is it a suggestion of the idea that this child will die on a tree or on wood uh, made from, you know, uh, will die on a tree. You know, is it a foreshadowing of Christ's death? But, you know, at the what most apparent level, you know, it's just this beautiful image of the Madonna holding her child. And here we see some of the details.